people want to know, yeah. is there proof for mm. UFOs flying over mm. what you say? Mm. Well, uh, I can say very easily that we have the proof about that. There is actually documented proof from the government's own, own files that uh, that whatever's in the air is definitely being looked at and chased by NORAD jets. It's very clear this, and the documents prove it. It's, it's quite. It's not my document. It's the government's document. So it's quite clearly they're telling me. They're telling us that they chase these things all the time and can't do anything about it. I think it's pretty provocative. So what is it that you have that actually says that? Uh, I received two documents uh, mixed in with uh, about 117 pages of documents from the government. And I'm going through all the documents, and one day if I find um, a air traffic control report, six pages. And I read it, and the first line says three U UFOs, pardon me, not UFOs, three tracks of interest. That's the term they use. They use tracks of interest. We're caught in radar by the NORAD radar. So they scrambled two CF-18 jets out of Comox Air Force Base in 2001 to chase these things. And the line by line by line, minute by minute by minute, as to where these jets are as they're flying, trying to reach the target. And once they uh, get up to about 35,000 feet, they can't find anything. They can't, they're still on the radar, but they can't see it. Then they run into, off to the side, a medical evacuation jet moving an LR-35, who radioed to them that they saw the three objects speeding off in an easterly direction. And from there, the CF-18s continued in, in an easterly direction to chase the UFOs, went up to 35,000 feet, and when they got within 90 seconds of the target, they radioed back to Comox Air Force Base, CF-18 jets 90 seconds from target. The next line reads, contact made, as all says. Is it possible that tracks of interest can refer to foreign, uh, foreign country jets in the air overhead? Not really. Um, if, if the, Tracks of interest re refer to something that doesn't have a transponder. Okay, now any aircraft that takes off anywhere in North America and lands in North America has to have a transponder. These tracks of interest are generally defined as um, uh, you know, tracks of interest. Like they're just unknown, totally unknown, completely unknown. That's why they send these things up in the air. What about an aircraft coming from China or Russia? They would have to our, enter our airspace with permission, and these things. These things don't ask for permission. So what do you have in terms of documents that, is there something to quote or look at or show me? Yeah. The first document looks like this. The first page of the document looks like that, heavily redacted. Can you hold it up a little okay. higher? Okay, there heavily are. redacted. Okay. All the white space in there is redacted because of the security requirement. is called S15, so they redact it. They, they just don't want us to know what's there. And you can see that's pretty, pretty well 99% uh, of, of that particular document. Then, after that, they give me this, which is the next page. Okay, a little less redaction. Basically, it reads, unknown tracks and a whole bunch of gobbledygook. And in terms of its unknown track, it's, it's used. They also use that term, too, unknown track, in addition to the word TOI, tracks of interest. And then ID down here was not possible. And then from that, the next page, which is unreadable for the viewers, which will be unreadable, is line by line delineation of what the jets were doing from takeoff to landing. And each line described what the jet is doing, radioing back to Comox Air Force Base. Such language as, um, let's give an example, CF-18s airborne at 11.58 that they're just reporting back. They say once again at some other point, uh, disconnected from chat, now talking on whatever, so there's just chatter back and forth. So it goes all the way through. And then eventually, it gets to a point where it says, time to target for CF-18s, 90 seconds. And this is at 35,000 feet. And then the next line reads, contact at 35,000 feet. So That's all that it says. You tell me. The government's not telling us. I can speculate as to what it might mean. They either saw something or they captured it on their radar. There was no mention of gun, uh, uh, wing gun cameras, anything like that at all. It just says contact made and nothing happening after it. Because the next line 
is totally elusive too. It's unreadable. It's just a bunch of numbers. So when they come back, they must have had to be debriefed, find out what they saw and what they did about it. And from there, we're left in the dark. When is this from? 2001. So within the last uh, 15 years, mm -hmm. this is something that was released from the government to a freedom of information request. That's correct. Right. Yep, that's right. That's right. Communication. That's right. Yeah. And this is what they gave back. So that's right. if they give it out, that means it's all right. Unless a clerk made a mistake. And that's my, that's another point about this particular document, because I asked for all reports of scrambled jets. I got one. <clears throat> I've since made a request for all others, but they're very, very um, slow in responding. And I have no doubt that that um, the document that I have um, is, is you know, totally authentic. It came in a package, and that there's no, the authenticity issue is off the table. It came directly from them. But the other problem with it is that I just received last December a letter from NORAD Command at Peterson Air Force Base in Colorado. And once again, <clears throat> though the print is very difficult to see. It's not something that you would uh, look at as a, it's a beautiful graphic representation, but it is from NORAD Command in, uh, at uh, Peterson Air Force Base. Okay. And this came separately in the mail to, to Zeland Communications. And essentially what it says, it goes through in the first and second paragraph, and it talks about the distribution of information being against certain types of information, being against the National Security Act. And then it goes on to talk about that this particular type of information uh, can be considered as unauthorized, and if it is disclosed in an unauthorized manner to people who are not um, cleared for it, that it is against the, um, the Espionage Act, Code Title 18, Section 793 and 794 of the United States of America. So in, es in essence, what this document is saying <clears throat> is the fact that I have this document and I've distributed it to unauthorized persons, which I have done, <clears throat> means that I could be indicted for um, espionage. Implicit in, say in what they're saying. Why did you take such a chance? Because someone's got to do it. Why? This is important. It's very important that people understand that the government is being cagey about all this information. They're hiding it under a veil of secrecy that's been existing for 70 years, and it t it's time for someone to, um, to stand up and, and scratch back. And that's what I'm, I'm inviting them to indict me for, for espionage. That would be an interesting, uh, if in fact that, that is, uh, in fact, the implication of the letter they're sending me. Is it possible that everything that's redacted would be the sensitive information, obviously, if it is redacted, and what they have allowed out is not breaking that boundary? No, I don't think so. I think the, the idea of what they've done is they've, they've released the document as a safe document, and that document itself is, will, stand, will stand alone. Um, now, whatever information they've redacted, they, they chose to do that, whatever clerk decided to do. Because there are people that they just do this by themselves. I mean, it's just somebody who does it, and that's the way it works. I sense the fact that I was sent that particular document with that line and contact made was an error in judgment on somebody's part. And that's my, that's my opinion. I'm not sure. Because they only sent me one. I asked for all. So you see how cagey they are. And say, well, let's just throw in this phone and see if he's satisfied. And I, you know, I wasn't. And that's why I think I got the letter after, after that. Is there any other kind of follow-up you can do with this particular case uh, in terms of finding out flight patterns uh, for the day, who, who, where, when, and that kind of information? That well, to do that kind of thing, um, you'd have to talk to Grant Cameron about that, but uh, to do that kind of thing would probably take another six to eight months. And where it would lead me, you know, it, it's, it's, you find a whole lot of fool's gold in this, uh, in this situation. And it takes a long time to find the actual gold pellet. And it's, I, I would rather work on it politically in another direction because I don't need any more information about the, about the flight. I would like to find out if there's any gun camera, um, make a request that way. That would be interesting to find out. But as far as flight patterns are concerned, um, that kind of stuff, I don't, I, I don't, I don't want to go into a, a situation where I'm chasing my tail because that's, that's what they do. And I know enough people who've been involved in freedom of information requests or AIA in Canada. They're just chasing the tail every six months. 
where do you hope to go with this now that you have that document? Well, I've given this document to um, a, a, a reporter uh, for a well-known um, newspaper here in Ontario. And I spoke to him yesterday. And just this morning, I emailed him this entire package of, of documents, plus uh, another 14 documents that uh, he, he wanted to have a look at. And he seemed very, very interested in it. And that's the first time a reporter has ever asked for this kind of document. So this stuff right now is also now in the hands of a Canadian journalist. The espionage threat and the air traffic control situation. And sometimes in the press, uh, they just look at it and put it in the, in the bottom of the drawer, and it's the last you see of it. Sometimes in the press, they take it seriously. So we'll see what this young fellow um, does. What's your end game goal for this? To show definitively that the government is grandstanding and lying about all the situation. They just throw, they just throw, you know, pieces of cheese or pieces of meat. Throws, you know, here's a bone chew on that for a while, and hope they're satisfied. And I'm not satisfied with anything that the government does in this issue. And that's why I want this stuff out with journalistic support. That's the only way. I can't do it myself. There's no possible way that I would have the media exposure uh, or the, the, the broad um, you know, access to the markets of, of a large newspaper to put that in the front page of a, of a, of a newspaper. I can't do it. We, that's why we depend on the press. And sometimes the press is our best friend, and sometimes the press is our worst enemy. And you have to look at that double-edged sword and try to balance between and treat these people with kid gloves and say, listen, this is the story of the century, the story of all history, and you could tell it if you wanted to. You have to convince your senior editors to get off their butts and do something about this and realize that it's not good enough for you to write one story and then bump your head over, uh, uh, you know, against the glass ceiling and not go any further with it. You have to do more. This is not a one-story uh, issue. This, you have to do research on this. You could be writing this stuff for the next two years. And I point out situations like, what's the, that new situation with the, with the money laundering, the Panama situation, the, the money. Every single day in the Star, there's something about it. So there's somebody at an executive level saying, we're putting this in the paper every single bloody day. Why isn't this there? So somebody has to have the courage to stand up and say, at an executive uh, position, we're going to do this. So it's going to take publishers, it's going to take editors, because they know the consequences of this kind of stuff. And I think it's impossible for them to say, well, let's just let it ride, because they've let it ride for far too long. My last question is, as somebody, who, as somebody who's been researching this topic for decades, mm -hmm. what is it you know that they're not telling? Well, what I know that but they're not... Have you come across in the decades of mm -hmm. research? But I know that they're not telling. Oh, everything. Is, I guess it's the, I shouldn't say that in, in, in a sense. I'm, I'm being glib about it. They, they've released a lot of information, and I must admit that. Canada has released 9,500 UFO files. That's where I got this stuff from, the Library of Archives Canada. But A, it's like reading the telephone book, and it's basically nonsense. It's just citing reports after citing report. But you go through the 115 pages that I that I had, and every once in a while you come up with a nugget like I got here. So sometimes they're giving you stuff that's hot, and sometimes you're just in, you know, including it in a bunch of other garbage. It's all just sort of confabulated together. So you really, you really have to use some discernment as to what's hot and what's not. So I think that's the whole thing about doing this kind of research. And you really have to dig deep and spend time on it. And something that when you find it, you know exactly what to do with it. You know what to do. And that's why I acted upon that particular ATC um, uh, document. So they're telling us a whole lot of stuff, but the problem is people aren't paying attention to it. And when I say people, I'm talking about journalists. You know, the, the, the thing that really bothers me is that we use the word government, and we're really not talking about the government. We're talking about uh, people behind the government and all the, the, the agencies that are there. The poor souls in Parliament and in Congress, they don't know anything about this. There may be, you know, a closet UFO uh, enthusiast, but generally speaking, they know nothing about it. But we're here to educate them, and the only way to do it, like I can't go and stand on the House of Commons floor and, and hold a seminar for these poor, simple people. That's impossible to do. So the only people who can do that in a logical, realistic, and accepted way is the, is the media. So we're depending on that. We really are depending on them.
so it's uh, it's their responsibility.